Hi everyone, welcome to CS188 section 2, and today we'll be talking about two topics, heuristics and a, a short introduction to CSPs, constraint satisfaction problems. So for heuristics, what's our motivation? So let's remember uniform cost search, UCS, and let's consider the scenario where, let's say we have Pac-Man, and Pac-Man wants to move to this goal star as fast as possible. So if we run uniform cost search, and let's just assume there are no walls, the, the fringe will explore something like this. First, it'll explore everything that's, let's say, a distance one away, then it'll explore everything that's a distance two away, and so on and so forth. And as you can see, it's exploring in every direction. So it's exploring towards the goal, towards the right, but it's also exploring to the left, and it's doing it equally as well as up and down and in every direction. So somehow this seems suboptimal because if Pac-Man is here and he's at 0 comma 0 and you tell him the goal is 2 to the right at 2 comma 0, then the search can maybe be better if we took this information into account. So this is where heuristics come in. So first let's start with the definition. So what is a heuristic? For us, we're going to call it as it's an estimate of how close to the goal you are. So if you've ever heard this phrase, it's, it's kind of like a rule of a rule of thumb. If you haven't heard this, you can ignore that. So let's give an example. So first let's consider these heuristics and let's draw this example graph. S A interval G and draw a pass like this. Okay, so if we look at this graph, so we have our standard nodes, start goal S, middle node A, and our goal G. We have the paths, we have the edge costs, which we've seen before, and then we also have these heuristics, H. So these heuristics are saying, for example, at state S, H says, I think I am too away from the goal. It doesn't know the path, but it says, I think the shortest path to get to the goal will be two. At A, um, the heuristic is saying, oh, I think I'm six away from the goal. And at the goal, the heuristic will always be zero because it's already at the goal. So with these heuristics comes our first search algorithm, and that's greedy search. Now, greedy search is, is pretty simple. It's uh, given, given your fringe, So given your fringe, uh, expand the node with smallest h, which is your heuristic. So with greedy search, it doesn't even care about these edge costs. So it doesn't care about the 5 or the 1 or the 3. All it's going to be looking at is the 2 and the 6 and the 0, which are the h values. So for example, uh, if I do greedy search on this graph, I start out with S, and I have my H is 0, so I cross it off, and then I add its children, S to A, and I only look at, what is A? A is a heuristic of 6, and I look at S to G, and since G it only has a heuristic of 0, and then I look at these two, and zero is smaller, so I pop it off and it passes my goal test. So the path I found is S to G. But as you can see, if we actually look at this graph, the cheapest path based on the path cost is S to A to G, which has cost four. But we returned S to G. That's where greedy search returned to. So this gives some motivation that the heuristic, what values it can take on matters and will affect the optimality of the solution you find. So what we want is we want UCS 
and the properties that it has, which is it always finds the optimal path. But we also want some properties from Greedy Search, in which our heuristic helps us explore faster. And by faster, that means expanding less states. So that brings us to A star search. So A star, and we'll do two different variants. But first, let's start off with the equation. Okay, so it's f of n equals g of n plus h of n. So now let's talk about this. So let me redraw. Okay, so in uniform cost search, well, let me define these. So g of n is going to be our backwards cost. h of n is going to be our forward cost. And f of n is our total cost. OK. So let's consider the case where we have no forward cost h. So we only have our backwards cost. So we have f of n e equals g of n. So this is going to be uniform cost search. So let me explain why. So for g of n, which is the backwards cost, that's how much it costs to get from the start to your current node. So let me draw a little diagram. So let's say I start at S and I take some path. Who knows? Do how many nodes? Doesn't matter. And there are nodes along the way. And I get to A. Now at A, there's going to be some optimal path. We don't know what it goes to. And it goes to G. And there's some nodes on this path. So the backwards cost is going to be from S to A. We're considering that we're currently at node A. I guess to make this cleaner, I can actually just call it, I can call it N, just like in the equation we have. So from start to N, G of N is our backwards cost. It's how much we've already traveled. So this is what UCS considers. It only considers where you've been. Now H of N is this forward part. Now G of N, we can calculate exactly. We've, we've gone through these nodes and we know the path cost. But H of N, we don't know. If we knew h of n and we knew the path, then the solution would be solved. We know how to get from s to n and n to g. So now if we have a star search, it's all about what do we choose for this h value. Now let's, let's consider the example above right here. And let's run through what h star does, or what a star does. And let's see what happens due to these heuristic values. And then that'll motivate uh, w some restrictions on the heuristics. So when we're doing A star, it's the same as uniform cost search, except the value we're keeping track of is not just G of n. It's G of n plus H of n. So let's just do this by example. So we start a state S. And we keep track of two things, and we keep them separate. It's, we keep track of g of n, how far we've traveled, so we start at s, we're at 0, plus our heuristic 2. So that's only 1, so I cross it off, and I add s to a, and that's going to be our path cost 1, plus the heuristic 7. And we also have s to g, which is our path cost 5, plus heuristic 0. So note that the reason I kept them separate is because it's the full path cost from where you've traveled, so how far did it take to get to S to A, plus only the heuristic at A. It's only the heuristic at the node that you're currently at. Okay, so now we're here and we look at S to G as the cheaper cost of 5 plus 0, 5. We pop it off and we see it passes the goal test. So now we're done. But as we can see, that just like the previous example, the optimal one is actually 
S to A to G. So clearly something's gone wrong, and it has to do with our heuristic. So let, let's take a look. Let's take a look up here. So we start at state S, and we're deciding whether we want to go to A, which is here, or we're deciding whether we want to go to G, which is there. So heuristics basically tell you how, how far do you think you are from the goal. So when we're considering S to G, H equals zero. So we're like, okay, we're very close to the goal. Now we're looking at S to A, and A has a value H equals six. So that says that, oh, whoa, A is pretty far from the goal. So that's why when we run A star, it's not able to tell that, oh, A is actually closer than it says it is. It sees, oh, S to G is closer, I'll go to that. It turns out it was wrong. So this all happened because this h equals 6 was too big. It made a seem too bad. So that motivates us to put some restrictions on what h should be. So this leads us to two concepts. Can I do some erasing? Okay, so it leads us to admissibility. So first, let me write the equation. So for a heuristic to be admissible, it has to be in between 0 and the optimal cost h star. So first, what is h star? This is the shortest path from n to the goal, g. So let's look at our graph above. We need to look at for each h, does it satisfy this requirement? So first, we start off at s. Now let's find the shortest path to the goal just by looking at it. So it's s to a to g, and that's 4. Our heuristic is 2. Therefore, we have 0 is less than or equal to 2 is less than or equal to 4, and we're good. Now let's look at a. The distance from a to g is 3. Me. That was a mistake. So the distance from S to A is G, which is our op optimal. Ugh. Sorry, I can make a mistake. It's 3. But what is H? H is 6. So we have a problem. This doesn't satisfy admissibility. Therefore, this heuristic is not admissible. So this is not admissible. So there's a proof in the lecture that shows why admissibility is required. Now note that this is admissible is required for tree search. So in tree search, you can expand nodes you've already you've already visited. But for graph search, we're going to need a stronger statement. So let's go into that right now. So let me make a table. We're going to have is the is a star optimal and we're going to have a star tree search and a star graph search and graph search is the one that keeps the visited nodes on in a set and you don't visit nodes that you've already visited So, A star tree search. What does it require to be optimal? It requires an admissible heuristic. And that's, as we stated before, H of n is less than or equal to H star of n. Now, for A star graph search, we need, for it to be optimal, we need something called consistency. Now, for consistency, let's talk about that right now. So let me draw S to A to G. Okay, so consistency requires this, that the heuristic 
at some node A minus the heuristic at the node that it travels to, C, is less than equal to the cost from A to C. Okay, so let's let's run through, let's de decipher what this means. So I have A, I have C, and I have some cost. So what it's saying is that if I start off at H of A and I go to a node H of C, I need the cost to be less than uh, the difference between the two. So H of A minus H of C is my, it's my guess for the edge cost. And what do I want? I want it to be less than or equal to the actual edge cost. So now we can see that this is similar to admissibility. So admissibility, if we look at it right here, is my guess for the path cost to the goal is less than or equal to the actual path cost. While consistency is saying my guess for all the edge costs are less than or equal to the actual edge costs. So we can see that this is stronger. In fact, we can say something else. So let's consider all heuristics that are admissible. They all lie within this circle. So we can say that actually within this circle lies all consistent heuristics. So what this means is that if a heuristic is consistent, then it's also admissible. And a, a good exercise would be to, to prove this. Take a heuristic that's consistent and prove that it also satisfies the admissibility constraint. Okay, so now that we have consistency, then also in the lecture, it shows that a star graph search will be optimal. And if you have any questions on admissibility or consistency proofs, we'd be happy to talk it over in office hours. Okay, so that's it for a star. Well, actually first, let me, let, let's talk a little bit about coming up with heuristics since this is very common when you actually want to do A star and you had to do in your projects and your homeworks. So for heuristics, let's do some examples. So let's consider the Pac-Man board. And Pac-Man's here, and let's see, he wants to go here. And maybe there's some walls that make it difficult. So when you're thinking about how do, how do I even come up with a heuristic? So in general, a heuristic is a relaxation. So take your given problem and make it easier. So for Pac-Man, the easiest one would be removing the walls. So if you remove the walls, what's your heuristic for getting from Pac-Man to the star? Well, that's going to be the Manhattan distance. So that's probably the first example that you've seen. But in general, you might have things besides uh, your distance or your coordinate. You might have the number of pellets or the ghosts. So a general strategy is uh, for each value in your state, Try and relax. So this your state could be, you know, positions, it could be pellets. And for each of these, try to come up with something that's an easier problem to solve because you want to underestimate the actual cost to reach your goal. Okay, so now let's do an introduction to constraint satisfaction problems, which are CSPs. So CSP stands for a constraint satisfaction problem. Okay, 
So let's consider the example that you saw in class. So let's draw Australia. I know that's not what Australia looks like, but it's close with the island Tasmania. And it has different states or provinces. So I'm going to cut up Australia. Now, what's our goal going to be? Our goal is to use three colors. So R, G, and B to color to color the states. But we have a constraint. No touching states have the same color. Okay, so for constraint satisfaction problems, we have some goal, which is for in this one to color the states, and then we have the constraint, or multiple constraints. And in this case, that no touching states have the same color. So there's three components of a CSP. There are the variables, there are the domains, and there are the constraints. So the variables are going to be the things that you're trying to find values for. So for in this example, it's going to be the the states of Australia. Now what are domains? The domains are all the values that the variables can take on. So in this case, it's going to be R, G, and B, the three colors. Now what are constraints? Our constraints are going to be that for states S1 and S2 touching, then S1 does not equal S2. So let's run through an example of what a solution to this problem would be. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So these are our states. So an example solution would be I color 1 red, I color 2 green, I color 3 blue, I color 4 red, I color 5 green, and 6 I could color red. So as you can see, the constraint satisfaction problems, some variables are easier to assign than others. For example, the island. The island could take on any R, G, or B because there are no constraints with it. While some states had to be very specific values. For example, three. Three touches every touches more than three other states. So it was very constrained. So how would we draw this? So in general, what we do is we take our states and we write them out as nodes. Then what we do is, for each constraint, we draw an arrow between the two states, or yeah, between the two nodes, saying that, oh, these are related, and I need to make sure I satisfy this constraint. So I'm going to draw constraints between all neighboring states. So 1 and 2 are neighbors, 2 and 3 are neighbors, 1 and 3 are neighbors, 3 and 4 are neighbors, 2 and 4 are neighbors, 4 and 5 are neighbors, and 6 is all alone. Now let me check that I've got all my constraints. I think that looks about right. Okay, so now we can view this as a graph. So we can, one approach would be to use your standard search problems and travel along these nodes and assign their values domains, and if you ever violate a constraint, then that's not valid and you go back. But in constraint satisfaction problems, we're going to take advantage of the structure so that we can solve these problems more efficiently. So for now, uh, since you haven't seen how to solve CSPs yet, 
I'm just going to do this introduction, and this is how you set up the CSP problem. 